Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. So glad you guys are here with us today. I also want to welcome my people watching us online. Wherever you are in the comfort of your house, you are a part of our community today, okay? So before I get started, I want to thank our amazing senior pastors, Pastor Andy and Sharon Mead, for giving me this opportunity. It's been fun hanging out with you guys for the past two weekends, man. It's been a lot of fun, okay? We're just going to learn more about Jesus again today. Does that sound good? That's what we're going to do. All right, so we are in part three of a four-part series called Uphill Habits, where we have been learning how to have godly habits in order to better our lives and in return, better the world around us. See, the theme of this series has been everyone has uphill hopes, but downhill habits. Everyone has uphill hopes, but downhill habits. Uphill habits. Uphill in the sense of you have an area that you want to accomplish, you want to get on the mountaintop, you want to see victory. But when we're trying to get to the top, sometimes we have these downhill habits that keep us um, on, on, the, on the floor. See, uh, where am I? Okay, we know, check this out. We know that we are products of what we repeatedly do. We know that we are products of what we repeatedly do. We know that we are products of what we repeatedly do. You are a product of what you repeatedly, repeatedly do. Check this out. We form habits, then habits form us. We form habits, and habits form us. You form a habit, and your habit will form you. Now, today we are going to talk about a habit that is very important. I would say this habit is the, is the habit you can use as motivation to keep first things to first things, like Pastor Andy talked about in part one of the series. And this is the habit you can use to renew your mind when times get hard, like I talked about last week. Today, we are going to talk about the habit of living your life aligned with the purpose of God. We're going to talk about the habit of living your life aligned with the purpose of God, the habit of a purpose-filled life. But now that we're talking about purpose, there's a question that I have to ask. There's a question I have to ask because, because whoever said purpose comes without problems? Whoever said purpose comes without problems? Whoever said your purpose will be easy to obtain? Who said that to you? See, if you're following along on your notes or, or following along on social media, you can title habit number three, the purpose and the problem. The purpose and the problem. Now, have you ever not understood the purpose of something? Like, have you ever, have, ever had a moment where you didn't understand what the purpose of that was? Now, I've been married for three and a half years now. Yep, come on, somebody. To, to the most beautiful woman in the world. Yes, yeah, she is. And... Um, and, and now since I've been married, though, I find myself asking a question very regularly. I find myself asking a question when we're doing things or Aaron's asking me to do things. I find myself asking this question. What's the purpose of that? <laughs> like, why do you want me to do that? What, why are we doing this? What is the purpose of that? For example, like in our, in, when I was single, I had a bed, right? And in my bed, I had two pillows, a blanket, and, and I had a stuffed animal because sometimes you get lonely, you know. So, and, but now that I'm married, my bed is filled with so many pillows I can't count. Like I can't even keep up with them. And here's the thing, though. And see, it sounds great. Yeah, bed filled with pillows, comfortable. It sounds awesome. Nope. Wrong. Wrong. Nope. Because these pillows are not to be laid on. 
So every night when I'm getting ready for bed, I have to remove pillows from my bed. And I asked Aaron, I said, Aaron, what's the purpose of unlayable pillows? I don't even understand why we have them. And she's like, they're for decorations. They're called throw pillows. I said, am I supposed to throw them at you? Like, <laughs> is this something to help when we argue? I don't understand. So check this out. It started there, and then it went to the couch. Now our, our couch has these extremely comfortable pillows that I want to use when I want to take a nap. Or when I'm just, you know, sometimes I like to hug things, man. And then there's other times when I'm eating dinner, I need them as a, as a plate, you know. <laughs> Not a plate, but you know what I'm saying. I ain't that trifling. But, <laughs> but every time I use them, Aaron just gives me this death look. I'm like, these pillows too? I can't use these? I said, what's the purpose of unlayable, unusable pillows? She says, you don't get it. I'm like, I don't get it. You're right. She's like, they're for decoration. I'm like, who are they decorating for? I don't even know. <laughs> what's the purpose of unlayable pillows, man? But, but for real, for real, have you ever found yourself in life asking questions like that? Like, what's the purpose of that? What's the purpose of that situation? God, what was the purpose of you bringing me through that? God, what is the purpose? Have you ever found yourself asking that question about your life? I know I have. God, why am I here on this planet? What do you want from me? What is my purpose? Now, the word purpose means the reason for which something is done or created or which something exists. Now, I want you to know today, I want you to know very clearly at the end of this message today that you have a purpose on this planet that God has created you for a reason, that you are not here on accident, you are not a mistake, but God has a specific purpose for your life. So you check this out, Psalm 139 puts it this way, you saw me before I was born. Did you know that God saw you before you were born? God saw you and knew you before you were born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. See, God was very aware of the plan and purpose for your life. God was very aware when he made you, and God is very aware of you right now. See, come on. See, see, God has a plan for your life, and it's a good plan. And you may be like, Pastor Jacob, how do you know God has a good plan for me? He may have a good plan for you, but how do you know he has a good plan for me? Well, I'm glad you asked, because I will let you know. Check this out. Ephesians 2.10 says this, for we are God's workmanship. I want you to personalize that, though. For you are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, not bad works, not for mistakes, not for accidents, but for good works, which God hath prepared before him that you should walk in them. See, God has placed good things inside of you. God has placed good things inside of you beforehand. Beforehand, what does beforehand mean? Before I give someone the hand, is that what that means? See, beforehand, the word beforehand means before an event or action ever took place. So you're saying to me, before I ever took one step on this planet, before I ever breathed one breath, that God already saw that he had a good plan for my life. Oh, I am telling you that. God has something good for you. He saw you and it was good. So if the scriptures declare that God saw me before I was born, that God prepared something good for me before I ever took a step, I must come to the logical conclusion that God has me here for a reason. God has you on this planet for a reason. But, but, here come that big old but. But what happens when life Problems come, and I feel like my life isn't aligned with the purpose of God. But what happens when problems in my family, in my job, in my dreams happen, and I don't see the purpose? Which leads me to my tweetable thought today. My problems can define my purpose. My problems can define my purpose. Purpose, purpose, purpose. You got 99 problems, but the church ain't one. <laughs> Whoever said purpose comes without problems? Whoever said problems negate purpose? I actually think purpose and problems go hand in hand. The word problem means this, a matter or situation regarded as unwelcome or harmful and needing to be dealt with and overcome. 
problems are an unwelcome event that must be dealt with and overcome. See, see, did you know that to climb uphill towards God this year, to climb uphill to achieve the dreams that you want, it will require you to deal with and overcome unwelcome situations in your life. To achieve the purpose God has for you, it will require you to look at the things that you don't want to deal with, to deal with the insecurities that you're trying to put off, to deal with the problems that you said, I'm going to handle it one day. God's saying for you to move uphill this year, you got to deal with them right now. I got something I want you to deal with right now. See, my phone blowing up. Okay, there you go. Sorry. <laughs> Because, check this out, because we all know, here you go, this, there's something that we all know. We all know everything worth having is worth fighting for. Everything worth having is worth fighting for. So when problems come up, there's things that we need to deal with because your marriage is worth fighting for. There's things that you need to deal with because your kids are worth fighting for. There's things you need to deal with because that destructive addiction is worth fighting to beat. God has placed a purpose on your life and you're going to be dealing with unwelcome situations. But I want you to know today that better is he who is in you than that he is in the world and you can overcome all things. Things. The habit, a habit we must have in order to move towards God is a habit that we must remind ourselves that there is purpose in my problems. There is purpose in my problems. See, check this out. We're going to read a story in the Bible together. It's very interesting. This is the first day. We're going to read about the first and second day of Jesus' purpose in his life. Check this out. Check this out. Jesus got baptized starting in Matthew 3. It says this. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and aligning on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son, whom I love, with him. I am well pleased. This is an incredible scene. This is a great scene. Jesus is baptized, and what we see in the scriptures is that all three members of the Trinity are in one place. We see God the Father declares, this is my son whom I love with him, I'm well pleased. God the Son being baptized, we see God the Spirit falling on Jesus and aligning him for his purpose. This is a nice way to kick off your purpose. This is a nice way to kick off your purpose. God is clearly in the scene. This is nice. Imagine if the first day at work looked like this for you. God's there speaking. Jesus is walking around, the, the spirit flying like a bird. You know, you'd be feeling pretty good about the first day of work, wouldn't you? You'd be feeling good about some things. See, but here's the thing. This is a great start. And I think all of us that have moments of great starts. We've all had great start moments, right? And we all have things that life, you know, things are going pretty good, you know. Sometimes our marriage, you're like, hey, man, this is going good, you know. I actually like being around them right now. This is good, you know. You know, your kids, you may you got some kids. Your kids are doing good, you know, job, you know, it's going pretty good. Life is feeling good. Life is good. And we all have these life is good moments, too, kind of in the beginning of the year, too, don't we? You know, our New Year's resolutions. We're ready to kick off, take on the year 2017 by 2018. Here I come. Mm -mm, I'm ready. You know, we think to ourselves we're going to eat clean, eat healthy this year. We say, we say, hello, broccoli. Bye bye biscuits, you know. We, you know, we say, we say hello, baked chicken, bye bye fried chicken, only sometimes, you know. We, we're, we're all, we all ready. We're gonna pray more. We're gonna read our Bible. We're gonna fill out that covenant card Pastor Andy gave us a couple weeks ago. And then you're like, yeah, you know, I've been coming to church. Jacob was talking about you never change your life until you change the way you think. I don't know what he was really talking about, but I'm gonna change my mind this year and it's gonna be good. You know, I'm gonna be nicer to my spouse this year. You know, this year I'm gonna spend less time at work, more time with the kids. You know, things are going good. I'm gonna do good. I'm gonna get my hashtag HSB. You know, everything's gonna be nice. HSB means hot summer body. You know, I'm going to get that ready. You know, it's all going to be good. I'm kicking it off right. But maybe it's just me. My problem isn't what to start off. My problem is with the consistency. See, my trainer, I had a trainer one time. His name was Daniel Davis. You just saw him two seconds ago. <laughs> I had a trainer 
And I said, trainer, I, I said, Dan, Daniel, I want to hashtag H H B. This is about three and a half years ago. I want to, I want to, I want to hashtag H H B. What does that mean? Hot honeymoon body. That's what that's what I was trying to get. And Daniel told me, he said, Jacob, that sounds good. We can do it. We'll work out. He said, Jacob, but I want you to know something. Progress is only found in consistency. Progress is only found in consistency. See, day one started off great for Jesus, but check out day two. Day one, people celebrating. Hey, this is going to be good. But check out day two. Then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the, the devil. Wait a second. Hold on. Hold on. Hold the door. Hold the door. Hold the door. Hold on one second. The spirit falls on Jesus. The voice of God declared, this is my son whom I love. I'm well pleased. It's a celebratory scene. Jesus' purpose being kicked off all nice. Everything all good. But the next thing he said, but the spirit led him to the wild. God, the Spirit led him to be tempted by the devil? But I thought people only go through hard times when they're disobedient to God. You ready for this one? I thought people only go through hard times when they're disobedient. But Pastor Jacob, you're telling me that the Spirit led him to the wild to be tempted by the devil? Yes. Check this out. Here's why. Point number one, your purpose must be tested and approved. Your purpose must be tested and approved. Here we have Jesus coming into the wilderness. Jesus was led up to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now the word tempted in the Greek is the same word for the word tested. Tempted and tested. Tempted and tested. Tempted and tested. Jesus was led to the wilderness and he was tempted by the devil. But in the wilderness he was tested by God. Tempted by the devil, but tested by God. And here's the truth. Here's the truth that we all can agree on. All, every single one of us can agree on this truth. We all hate taking tests. I never met one person that said, you know, I just can't wait to go home tonight, kick up my feet on the couch, get a nice glass of wine, and take a long test. You know, I've never met that person ever, you know. And if that is you today, we have a prayer team down here that would love to pray with you because you need some deliverance. See, see, we hate taking tests. We hate taking tests, but we love things that have been tested and approved. We hate taking tests, but we love things that have been tested and approved. For example, the reason why you drove 60 miles an hour to church today, not just because you were late, but the reason why you drove 60 miles per hour to church today or the reason why you drive 60 miles per hour on the interstate is because your brakes have been tested and approved. Because they have been tested and approved. See, imagine if you would have bought that car and, you, and, you, and the car salesman hands you the keys. And you're like, hey, mm, don't know if the brakes work, but good luck, buddy. Give me the check. You, know, you probably wouldn't have bought that car, right? The reason why you drive it is because it's been tested and approved. Here you go. I want you to see you drive it because it's been tested. And since it's been tested, it's been approved. It is proven. It is proven. I want you to get this. It is proven. Its purpose is proven in its test. Its purpose is proven in the test. Its purpose is proven in the test. See, God sent Jesus up to the wilderness to be tested. See, God put a purpose on Jesus to be Savior of the world and die for the sins of all humankind. See, but Jesus, who was 100% God, he was also 100% man. And since he had the tendencies of man inside of him, did you know that Jesus had the opportunity to opt out of his purpose too? Did you know that Jesus had the opportunity to opt out of his purpose? And the reason why we can connect with Jesus is because Jesus is relatable to us. Because I don't know about you, but have you ever had a moment where you kind of felt like you want to opt out on the purpose that God has for you? See, God knew this. And since God knew this, God said, in order to see if he is willing to fulfill the purpose, let me put him to the test and see if he will be approved. Let me put him to the test and he will be approved. Now, was the devil in charge of the test? No. No, he wasn't in charge. Are your problems in charge of you? No. But will God use the devil to proctor your tests? 
Will God use your problems to proctor your test? Yes, he will. Check this out. And James 1 tells us this. Blessed is the one who perseveres on their child because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. So does God tempt? No, but will God test? Yes. See, you may be dealing with some issues that you don't understand why it's happening. Your marriage may actually be struggling. You're not sure why. You may find yourself anxious and you're not sure why. You may be having a hard time at work or you may be having a hard time trying to figure out why you are here. And you're ready to give up. You're ready to get rid of things. You're ready to throw things away. You're ready to get rid of that marriage. You're ready to get rid of those relationships. But may I just add today that the things you're trying to get rid of, God may be be using to test and approve you. God may be using those very things to test your character, to test your perseverance, to see if you can fulfill the purpose he has for you. See, God did not bring Jesus into the wilderness to be tested just for fun or just because, but God knew that it was in the wilderness that Jesus could step into the person God needed him to be. And may I say something to you today. May I say that since God knew you before you ever took a step on this planet, that God wants to introduce you to your real self. May I say that God wants to introduce you to your real self. There's a you that you haven't met yet, and God wants you to meet that person. God wants you to meet that version of you. There's a stronger you, a wiser you, a more peaceful you, a you that stresses less but praises more, a you that has on tap abilities and capabilities, and God wants to bring the old you face to face with the new you and show you why you're here on this planet. Let's give God some praise right now. Your purpose, point one, your purpose must be tested and approved. Point two, your purpose must be protected. Your purpose must be protected. Your purpose will be tested, so you must protect it. Here is Jesus in the wilderness. He's been up He's been led up by the spirit to be tempted by the devil. Check this out. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Yep. Sound about right. <laughs> so, you know, he wants something to eat. He wants some grub. Jesus is tired. He's worn out. He hasn't eaten in 40 days. And check out what happens. The tempter came to him and said, if, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. I got some hot sauce. I added that part. Now, there's a couple interesting things here. There's a couple interesting things happening here. The first one is Jesus is uphill, and the tempter came to him. He saw that he was hungry, and he said, if you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God. Now, here's the problem. The first thing that the enemy uses to try to get Jesus is this. The first thing that the enemy does to try to get at Jesus is he tries to challenge his identity in God by questioning what, what, what God already spoke over him. He tried to challenge his identity in God by questioning the words that God already spoke over him. Then the next thing that he does after challenging his identity by questioning what God already spoke over him, he challenges his identity by telling him to give in to the way that he feels right now in this moment. You hungry? Eat. You feel that way, don't you? That means that's who you are, isn't it? Your feelings are, your feelings determine who you are, don't they? And just because you feel something, that does not mean that's who you are. Just because you feel a certain way, does not, that does not mean that's what you should do. The enemy said, if you are the son of God, but we just read before that God declared, this is my son whom I love, with them I am well pleased. See, a good way to protect your purpose is by this. A good way to protect your purpose is to understand the difference of the way God speaks and the way the enemy speaks. A good way to protect your purpose is a way is when you understand the way God speaks and the way the enemy speaks. See, God speaks with certainty. This is my son. The enemy, he speaks with suggestions. If you are the son of God. 
if you are, if you are, if you're a child of God, if you're a child of God, I mean, it's not that big of a deal if you turn that stone into bread. It's, I mean, it's not that big of a deal. It's how you feel in this moment, isn't it? And since it's how you feel, you should do it, right? I mean, who cares that maybe you are a dad and maybe you are a husband, but if you feel like having that affair with that person because you feel like it in that moment, it's not that big of a deal. I know you got some stuff, but I know you got some stuff going on, but you feel like like this so maybe you should spend less time with your family and more time at work because that's how you feel and since you feel that way that means that's who you are you feel like dating that person even though you know they trifling you feel like doing that thing even though you know it ain't good for you but because you feel it you should do it if you are anyways are you really a child of God are you really the son of God because if you were do whatever you want, right? Notice the response. Notice the answer of Jesus. He said, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Jesus' answer is this. My God speaks with certainty about who I am when you're suggesting these false things about me. Then it's, it continues, the story continues. It says, then the devil took him to the, high, to the holy city and said to him, I'm sorry. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point in the temple. If you are the son of God, see, I want you to know, he says it again. He questions him again. He says, if you are the son of God, and you may be wondering why you're dealing with the same problem over and 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 over again. The reason why you are is because the enemy will love to zone in on one thing in your life. he will keep questioning and challenging that one thing. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. The enemy attacks his purpose by questioning what God already spoke over him. But this time the enemy takes scripture to try to trick Jesus up. And I just got to add something to that. I got to add something. I got to throw something out there to you today. Just because something sounds good doesn't mean it's good for you. Just because someone looks good and they look real good. That don't mean that person's good for you. See, see, check out the response of Jesus. He said, Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Now, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 6.16. Now, what happened in Deuteronomy 6.16 for Jesus to go there? See, what happened in Deuteronomy 6.16 was that the people of God wanted God to prove his goodness and love by doing something supernatural and miraculous. They wanted to test God. And God's like, you don't got to test me to show how I'm good. See, and this is what Jesus does. Jesus says, to the enemy, it is wrong to take scripture and use it incorrectly. But Jesus also does this. He also says the goodness of God does not need to be proven by the supernatural because God's goodness can be proven by the practical things that God wants you to do. So here you go. I actually believe in the supernatural. I believe God can deliver. I believe God can heal. I believe if you're sick, let me pray for you. God can heal you. I believe that God can do anything and all things. But as much as I know God can do all things, one of the best things that God does for us, he gives us the ability to choose the practical. He gives us the ability to choose the practical. Why would Jesus need to jump off of a building when he can walk down some stairs? Why did he need to jump off a building when he can walk down some stairs? We're over here looking for the miraculous, and God's just waiting for you to do the practical. See, you were looking for a miraculous thing to happen in your marriage, and God's saying, go on a date night. You're waiting for the miraculous, and God says, protect your purpose. Go on a date night with your spouse. Protect your purpose. Sign up for those classes that you keep putting off. Protect your purpose. Go to counseling and address those issues that keep coming up. Protect your purpose by getting a job. You know who you are. Don't wait for the miraculous and miss out on the practical. Point one, per, your purpose will, must be tested and approved. Point two, your purpose must be protected. And my third and my final point today is this. Your purpose must require you to have a proper perception of who you are in God. Your purpose must require you to have a proper perception of who you are in God. Who are you in God? Where is your identity found? Where is your purpose rooted? It is important for you to know 
how to view God, but it is just as important for you to know how to view yourself and who you are in God. Here's Jesus being tested and tempted. He's dealing with the problem and the purpose. The purpose, the reason for why he was created, the problem and the unwelcome situation that must be dealt with and overcome. Purpose and problem. In every purpose, there is a problem. But may I add, in every purpose, with every problem, there is your perception of God in that purpose and in that problem. How do you view God in the problems of your life? How do you view God in the purpose of your life? We are products of what we repeatedly do. We form habits and our habits form us. And I want you to get this right here. I think this is vital for you. Our habits are a direct reflection on how we view God. Your habits are a direct reflection on what you believe about your God. We view God, how we view God is directly related to how we handle the problems and purpose in our life. Now here's the last test. Jesus has gone through it. He has, he's been going through it 40 days, 40 nights without any food. He's been, he's been seeking God. He's been trying to figure out what's happening. The enemy came in. The enemy's trying to drop these lies in his head. If you are the son of God, if you're this, if you're that. He has all these things. He's tired spiritually. He's tired mentally, emotionally, physically. Jesus has gone through it. And has life ever make you just go through it? He's like, man, I've been going through it. I've been going through it, man. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. Let's see how the story ends. Again, the devil took him to the very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he says, all this I will give you if you will bow down and worship me. Uphill. He's uphill. The enemy takes him to the highest point of the mountain. And just because you reach the mountaintop, that does not mean you aren't susceptible to temptation. I actually believe the higher you climb, the more aggressive the enemy becomes for your life. I believe the more breakthrough, breakthrough that you see, the more that God heals you and frees you, the more the enemy is going to try to come to trip you up. See, see, this last temptation, the last test is highly important for you to understand the magnitude of the request that the enemy gives Jesus. He took Jesus to the mountaintop, showed him the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said, if you bow to me, if you bow to me, if you bend the knee, John Snow, if you bow to me, if you bow to me, all these things I'll give you. Now here's the problem. The enemy is saying, Jesus, you can have all your kingdoms and you can have all their splendor, and you can have it all if you bow to me right now, and you don't have to take on the cross. You want to have to take on the cross. You want to have to take on the pain of the cross, Jesus. God's going to make you go through a cross? God's going to make you die for people that won't even receive you? No, that ain't, that ain't your purpose. Bow to me right now. That's your purpose. I'll give you everything. I'll give you everything. The enemy challenges Jesus' perception of God's goodness to him. You don't need that cross. Here's the truth, though. Often we compromise our purpose not because, not because we don't think God is for us, but we think to ourselves, how could God ever use us? How could God ever use me? And is what God has for me really better than what the world is offering me? Is it really that much better? But I want you to see how Jesus claps back here. I want you to see the response of Jesus to Satan. Jesus says, very simply, get out of here, Satan. He says, get up out of here, Satan. He says, he doesn't entertain the thought. He doesn't entertain the suggestion. He just says, get up out of here. He says, because I know God has a purpose for me, and my purpose is not found in having earthly kingdoms, but my purpose is found in the people that God wants me to save. And I'll go to the cross to save every one of them, because greater is that purpose than some kingdoms. And I want you to know today, for you this year, to achieve the dreams that God has for you, to reach the mountaintops, your favorite phrase this year must be, get up out of here, Satan. 
Get up out here with that lie. Get up out here. I'm not insecure. Get up out of here. My family is worth fighting for. Get up out of here. My finances will be changed. Get up out of here. I will reach my dreams. Get up out of here. God has a purpose for my life. Get up out of here. Because Jesus understood what his God looked like. And he knew that his God was good. And he knew that he was in God and God was in him. And I want you to know that you are in God and God is in you. And if God is stronger, that means you are stronger. If God is smart, then you are wise. And if God is father, then you are his child. Your perception of God is important to overcome the problems that come at you. Jesus says to him, for the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil went away and angels came and took care of him. Did you know that when you worship God, the devil will go away? Did you know the devil at best is a dog chained up on a, on a leash to a gate? He can't get you. He can't attack you. The devil is all bark, but he's no bite. The devil will try to say that you ain't worth it, that you ain't got it. But God is stronger. God is better. How can a defeated foe tell you who God has, what God has for you? It is through the problems that your purpose can be defined. And friends, even when problems come, you can align your life. Well, God's purpose, bow your heads with me. Let's pray. God, God, we thank you. We thank you that you are good. We thank you that you are for us and not against us. We thank you that. You are greater than the problems of this world. God, we thank you that our problems may come, but you are higher and greater than our problems. You may be in here today and you feel like you have some problems that are coming. You're dealing with some issues that you won't believe, and they're knocking you out of alignment. And I feel like God is saying he's for you, he's with you, and I feel very clearly that God is saying look to the cross. Look to the cross. Because I was perfectly aligned on that cross for you. And three days later, Jesus says he got back up again for you. You have purpose on this planet. I feel right now God is speaking against negative words that were spoken over you. You are not those things. You are a child of the most high God. He is for you, not against you. Align. Align your life with the purpose God has for it. You may be in here today, or you may be watching us online, and you're saying to yourself, I don't know this Jesus you're talking about. I've been dealing with some problems. But Pastor Jacob, I want to know that Jesus. If that's you today, if you want to make a decision to trust Jesus with your life, I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now. I'm not going to call you up or anything like that, but right where you are, either in this auditorium or wherever you are watching online, if this is you, if you want to make a decision to trust Jesus with your life, I want you to pray this prayer. Just right where you are, say, Jesus, forgive me for my mistakes. Make me new. I have purpose in you. You are greater than my problems. Today I trust in you. Today, I say you're Savior of my life. In Jesus' name, everybody says amen. Amen. Let's give God some praise in here. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.